All right. Good morning. Aren't you glad today that we serve a risen Lord? And it doesn't matter what you're going through today. Life is worth the living because Jesus is alive. And you and I have been promised an unbelievable future because of the fact that Jesus died for our sins and rose again and has promised us life eternal. Please take your Bibles with me today and turn to the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. We're going to be in two different passages. We're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 1, and then we're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 3. So we're going to conclude uh, the message today in a unique way. We're going to bring a panel of some of our seasoned parents up, and we have received questions from you in the congregation, and we want to try to answer some of those questions for you in a biblical, practical way as we strive to uh, push our families towards Toward Jesus. And then at the end of the message, we're going to take the Lord's Supper today as we're going to remember what Jesus Christ has done for us. So let me ask you, how many of you have ever traced your family tree? All right. Any of you uh, done the uh, Ancestry.com study? Some of you done that? Uh, my daughter-in-law did the Ancestry.com study and found out where her, her family had come from. So uh, we're kind of in this thing, Mark, our son, is kind of tracing his family tree. And with DNA testing and with the Internet, it's a little bit easier to investigate from where we have come and who our families are and from where they originated. For example, I have a simple Burkholder family tree that I want to put up. And so you can see Brian and Vicki down on the bottom, and so I kind of did it the way we should, and uh, obviously my parents are Ray and Norma Burkholder, and they're here today with us, and my grandparents were Armin and Glenda Burkholder, and my great-grandparents were John and Fanny Burkholder, and you can keep going back in our family tree and see that, that Burkholder line. It's really cool. Our family migrated to the United States in the 1700s hundreds from northern Switzerland. You probably hear Burkholder and think, got to be German, right? Got to be German. Well, we were, we were from German descent in northern Switzerland. And when you trace it back uh, in our family, uh, some of our ancestors were pastors there in northern Switzerland that came to the United States fleeing some persecution that they were experiencing there in Europe. And so I say that because not only can we trace our family tree biologically, but we can trace our family tree spiritually as well. And that's really cool to me. And so uh, I just had to do that. Not only can you look backward on the Burke holders, but I have a picture. You can look forward on the Burke holders, and you can see several generations of Burke holder guys there with Mark and Justin, and then uh, uh, little Titus there, who's going to be our future pastor in just, uh, in just a few years. What I say is this. It's, it's really exciting to trace your genealogy. And, and how cool would it be to not only trace your genealogy biologically, but as I just mentioned, to be able to trace your genealogy spiritually? Better yet, how cool would it be to know that your kids and your grandkids are not only your biological ascendants, but that your kids and your grandkids moving forward are your spiritual brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. So, so today we complete this four-week series that we've titled Hashtag Family Goals. And, and our main idea, our purpose has been very, very simple. Our purpose is this, as parents and even as grandparents, as parents and grandparents, it is important or, or our most important responsibility is to help our children become passionate disciples of Jesus Christ. We flesh that out. I'm not going to speak all three of those messages again. We began in Deuteronomy chapter 6. 
You'll remember, if you haven't watched the message, you can go back on our website or on our app, and you can watch our message. And, and we saw the idea that your relationship with Jesus is the most important factor in the discipleship of your kids. In other words, you can't produce in your kids what you are not. In order for them to be disciples, you have to be a disciple. Two weeks ago, Pastor Jose spoke about the importance of putting Jesus first. There, there are many things that clamor for our family's attention, but it is so important for us to apply the truth of Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, as Jose powerfully told us, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. Last week, we shared some practical ways that you can tell your kids about Jesus. Today, I want us to look at just a couple of verses, and I want to take just a few minutes and kind of centralize all of this, and then bring some of our seasoned parents up and ask a few questions as we generalize this and bring this series to a close. And so, if you have your Bibles with me, we're in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, we're going to start in chapter 1 and then bounce over to chapter 3. 2 Timothy, chapter 1, beginning in verse... Five, Paul says this, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5. Paul says, for I am reminded, Paul is speaking to Timothy, his son in the faith. Paul says, for I am reminded of your sincere faith. Notice this, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and then in your mother Eunice and now, I am sure, dwells in you as well. So there do you see, do you see Timothy's spiritual genealogy? Paul is saying, Timothy, I commend you for your faith, but it was a faith that began, first of all, in your grandmother, that was then passed down to your mother, and now has been passed down to you. Jump over to chapter 3, verses 15, 16, and 17. You're familiar with a few of these verses. Paul tells Timothy, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Paul says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness that the man of God, the woman of God, may be complete and equipped for every good work. Would you pray with me today? Lord, I pray today that the Holy Spirit of God would take the Word of God, and Lord, help us to see the importance of creating a spiritual genealogy, of passing the baton, as we saw in our very first message, of teaching our kids and our grandkids, the truth of God's Word. So Lord, I pray that like our brother Timothy, I pray that we would have a spiritual genealogy, not just moving backward, but Lord, maybe even today, starting a spiritual genealogy that will move forward, reaching our ascendants, our children, our grandchildren, and future generations with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for that. Challenge our hearts today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A couple of simple truths, and then we want to get practical for you today. The first is this. Let me challenge you to be committed to begin a genealogy of faith. If you have your outlines, it's there. Be committed to begin a genealogy of faith. We read chapter 1 and verse 5 where Paul says, I'm reminded of the faith that began in your grandmother that was passed on to your mother and now that is passed on to you. We've already alluded to it, but did you catch the sequence of Timothy's spiritual genealogy? I put it up on the screen so you saw the Burkholder spirit, uh, genealogy. Here's Timothy's spiritual genealogy. So Timothy was taught God's word by his mother mother Eunice, who was taught God's word by her mother, Lois. And obviously, Lois was involved in the training and the teaching of Timothy as well. You might sit back and ask, Brian, what about Timothy's father? 
Paul doesn't say anything about Timothy's father. Where was Timothy's father in, uh, in his life? And we know very little about Timothy's father. Acts chapter 16 and verse 3 tells us that his father was a Greek, that, that his father was a non-believing Gentile. We're not sure whether Timothy's dad was living in the home. We're not sure whether Timothy's dad was disconnected. We do know that Timothy did not follow the Jewish beliefs. Timothy was not circumcised as a child. So I'm sure that the dad uh, uh, presented some spiritual influence on Timothy's life, but we don't know whether he was active or not. The Bible tells us very little, but we do know that there were two individuals who greatly impacted Timothy's life. And from the very earliest moments of his life, these two ladies began to inculcate into his mind and to his heart, began to teach him God's Word. Here's an encouraging point, and I want you to catch this today. One parent or one grandparent can have great influence on a family. Did you catch that today? One parent, one grandparent can have great influence on a family. I say that today because you may be here and you're a single mom who, who is trying your best to raise your kids in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and you're sitting back wondering, can I do this? The dad is not involved. The dad is not a spiritual influence. Take heart. Lois did it or Eunice did it in Timothy's life. You may be a single dad or, or you may be a grandparent who, who is trying to raise up your grandchildren. Take heart in knowing that God can use you to point your child, your grandchild to Jesus Christ. That's so important. I don't want you to sit back and think, boy, you know what? Our family's not the perfect nuclear family. I don't have the support of my spouse. And so it's impossible for us to accomplish this. God did it in Timothy's life. And Timothy became a tremendous man that God used in a great way. God can use you. Whatever your situation is, be committed to begin a spiritual genealogy. I would say this, that a strong faith is the greatest legacy that you can pass on to your family. Let that resonate in. The greatest legacy that you can pass on to your family is a spiritual legacy, a strong faith. I want to, I, I don't have the opportunity to do this very often, so I want to publicly thank my mom and dad who who taught me God's Word when I was a little boy. And not only taught me God's Word, but taught my brother and my sister God's Word. And all three of us, thank God by His grace and the influence of our parents, we are in the faith today. And we've been able to pass that on. We've been able to pass that on to all of our kids. We've been able to pass that on to our three kids. And my brother's passed that on to his three kids. And my sister has passed that on to her two kids. And I'm able to stand before you today by the grace of God and say all of our kids and all of my nieces and nephews are followers of Jesus Christ. And I can carry it further and say that all of their kids, now our grandkids, their great-grandkids, even though they're young, they're beginning to learn about Jesus. And we long for the day when those little ones place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I am who I am today because of the grace of God and because of parents who loved Jesus and lived out the truth of the gospel. I say that to commend them. They're not here very often to do that, to commend them. But I say that to challenge you because your family can be the exact same way. You might sit back and say, oh, no, Brian, man, you have no idea what our family's like. I don't know what your family's like, but I understand the power of the gospel. And I understand the power of God's word. And I understand what the Holy Spirit of God can do with the word of God in the hearts and lives of little ones. Be committed. Committed, be committed to begin a spiritual legacy. 
a spiritual genealogy. You might sit back today and say, man, Brian, I wish I had your spiritual heritage. I wish I had grandparents, and I wish I had great-grandparents, and I wish I had ancestors. I wish I had somebody in my faith who knew Jesus that I could point back to as a spiritual guide in my life. You might not have that in your life, but here's the thing. It can begin with you. And a spiritual genealogy always begins with someone. Would you make a commitment today that you want to be that type of parent, that type of grandparent, that type of aunt, that type of uncle who is going to point the next generation to Jesus Christ? There's a second thing that we see in this passage, simple but so profound. And the second truth is this, be committed to faithfully teach the Scriptures to your kids and to your grandkids. Chapter 3 and verse 15 Paul said this about Timothy. He said, from childhood, you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise through, or wise to salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Let me just flesh that out for a second. The word sacred writings, you say, Brian, what is that? Depending upon your translation, your translation might say the Scriptures. Timothy, from a child, you have known the Holy Scriptures. The ESV uses the phrase sacred writings. The idea being they didn't have the New Testament. When Paul was writing this, they didn't have a complete version of the New Testament. And so what, what Eunice had and what Lois had were the Old Testament Scriptures. The Scriptures that you and I today would say, man, those are tough to understand. I'm not sure whether a child can understand those Old Testament Scriptures. We would much rather begin in the New Testament. Paul says, listen, Timothy, from just a little boy, your grandmother and your mother took those sacred writings, those Old Testament Scriptures, and, and, and taught them to you and read them to you over and over and over and over again, so much so that from a child, you became acquainted with the sacred writings. The writings which what? Make you wise unto salvation. The word childhood has the idea of a very young age. One of the questions that we've received from parents is this, at what age do I begin teaching the word of God to my kids? Here's the simple answer as early as you possibly can. <laughs> Begin reading God's Word to them. Whether they're your kids, your grandkids, your nieces, your nephews, begin reading God's Word to them. Why is that? Because Paul says this. He said, it is God's Word. It is those, it is those sacred writings that make that child what? Wise unto salvation. Do what? It helps them to understand the Word of God so that they in, in turn then will be ready to give their life to Jesus Christ. Here's a verse that Paul uses in Romans chapter 10. Paul says this, catch this, I'll put it up on the screen. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing, what does he say? Through the Word of Christ. So, so, so here's what Paul said. Faith is not just something that sprouts in your family. Faith is not just something that your child or your grandchild is going to have because you possess it or someone else in your family possesses it or because you even bring them to church on a regular basis. Faith is the result of God's Word. And, and catch this. They will not grow in their faith. They will not become wise unto salvation unless they hear the Word of God. They must hear God's Word. Faith comes through hearing and hearing through the Word of God. A couple simple practical truths. I alluded to it just a moment ago. Start teaching biblical truth early in their childhood. Start teaching biblical truth early in 
their childhood. Today, we're going to give out through our children's ministry to every parent here. If you have a parent in our children's ministry, you're going to receive one of these from us today. It's simply called New City Catechism for Kids, but basically what it is, it's just 52 questions and 52 biblical answers that you can begin teaching your child at no matter what age you can begin. It starts out with the very first question. What is our only hope in life and death? And the answer is that we are not our own, but belong to God. What is God? God is the creator of everyone and everything. I told you today, and I didn't put it in my my PowerPoint, my little two-year-old granddaughter, my my daughter-in-law, Jenny, asking little Olivia at two years old, Who is God? And Olivia responding at two years old, he is the creator. Listen, it is never too early to begin teaching your child, your grandchild, your nieces, your nephew, somebody with whom you have influence. It is never too early to begin teaching them biblical truth. And let me just say this. I want to I wanna do a shout out today for Jaquetzia and all of our people in our children's ministry that are back there every single Sunday. While you're in here, we have scores of workers who are out there that are, that are teaching God's Word. As a matter of fact, let me do this. If you're involved in children's ministry and you're in here today, would you do me the honor of standing? I know we have Nelson and Josie over here. Who else do we have? If you're involved in children's ministry, would you stand for just a second? Anybody else? All right, we have several who are involved in children's ministry. Let's, let's thank them today. I want you to know that our, that our children's ministry is not just a glorified babysitting service. But each of those folks regularly teach God's Word to those kids. And you can be sure that if you bring your kids here on Sunday, that they're going to hear God's word. And I'm grateful for that, and I'm thankful for that. But Sunday's not enough. These kids are being bombarded with secular truth through the television, through social media, through school, through all of those things. On a regular basis, you as a parent need to begin to teach them God's Word. Here's another question, and we're going to answer some questions in just a second. Because someone might say, well, Brian, number one, how, how do I know when they believe How do I know whether they will understand it or not? I'm not sure I can teach it in a practical way that they will be able to understand it. Listen, catch this. I can't say this more or, or, or more simply. Don't worry about whether they will understand it or not. It's the job of the Holy Spirit of God to teach them. So, so it's your job to share truth with them. It's the job of the Holy Spirit of God to teach them. You say, well, Brian, there's a lot of the parts of the Old Testament that I don't understand. I'm with you. I'm with you. But, 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 The job of the Holy Spirit is to take the difficult truth of God's Word and bring it to the heart and the mind of that child in such a way that they understand the truth of the Gospel. If you sit back and say, man, I'm not sure they're going to understand any of this, so I'm not going to share it with them. You are robbing your children. You are robbing your grandchildren of hearing the truth of God's Word. Hey, get this. Trust the Holy Spirit to do His job. Sometimes when we question God's Word, we're not, we're not questioning the ability of our kids to understand. We're not even questioning our ability to be able to explain it. We're sitting back saying, is God capable of taking the truth of the gospel and bringing it to the heart of the child? And I want to assure you today, He is. That's his job. That's what he is supposed to do. So the simple truth is this. If we will do our job and trust him by faith to do his job, God's going to take that seed that was planted in the heart of that little one. And that seed is going to germinate. And one day that seed is going to sprout. And that little one is going to understand their need of Jesus and is going to come to him by faith. Trust, trust the word of God to do its work 
in the life of your family. Watch this verse, look at this verse, Isaiah 55 and verse 11. The prophet says this, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return empty, but it shall accomplish, it shall accomplish, it will accomplish that which I purpose, and it shall succeed in the thing for which I send it. What's the idea mean? God uses his word. All of us have sat either reading our Bibles, we've been listening to a preacher preach, a teacher teach, and all of us know what it's like, at least I hope you do, to be convicted by the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God takes a truth and all of a sudden you comprehend it. You don't, you don't understand it before and all of a sudden you comprehend it and he drives the truth home and it becomes real to you. You understand how the Holy Spirit works in your life. Trust the Holy Spirit of God to do that in your life of your kids. Whatever the age is, I'm not just talking about little ones. I'm talking about middle schoolers. I'm talking about teenagers. And catch this, mom and dad, I'm talking about adult children as well. One of the questions that we've received from parents is this, and we're going to address it in just a moment. Brian, what do I do with an adult child who is away from the Lord? How do I... How do I minister to that adult child? And I would submit to you, catch this mom and dad, your responsibility does not end the moment that child moves out of the house or the moment that that child goes to college. They are always your son. They are always your daughter. You are always mom and dad. Dad, you are always the spiritual leaders of your home, regardless of your age and regardless of their age. And you can and you should look for opportunities to take the Word of God and drive the truth of God's Word home in the lives of your kids. So I'm going to ask, we could have chosen a lot of couples in our church, but I'm going to ask uh, two other couples. I'm going to ask Vicki if she would come, and I'm going to ask Jim and Bev Russell if they would come, Jim and Bev, and I'm going to ask Eric and Kim Howard if they would come. And so the, these are just seasoned parents, and I'm going to uh, allow you to meet them, and we have asked you to submit questions for us. And so as we conclude this series, as we've said over and over, and we not only want to be biblical, but we want to be practical for you. Come on up, don't be shy. Come on up, don't be shy. All right, these are great people, and uh, come on up. I'm going to grab a seat, too, if I can not be nervous and, and, and be able to sit down and be calm. But um, um, we want to be able to uh, share with you um, just some of our experiences and some of the things that we have learned. And so I'm going to just grab some microphones and pass them out here. All right, so first of all, let, let me just let you meet them, if I can move this. Is that all right, Jonas? All right, so Eric and Kim, introduce yourself. Tell us about your kids. Uh, my name is Eric. This is uh, my wife, Kim. We have a 22-year-old uh, son and a 19-year-old uh, daughter. All right. Jim, Bev. Uh, I'm Jim Russell. It's my wife, Bev, and uh, we have three children and 10 grandkids. All right. Huh? <laughs> so I would say this, and, and we want to clarify this, and I know they want me to say this. We are not perfect parents, right? We're not perfect parents. We're not perfect grandparents. As a matter of fact, like any parents, we probably have made more mistakes than we have done the right things at times. But we've kind of been there and kind of done that. And so um, we've asked all during the week for our congregation to give questions. And I think we've had eight or nine questions submitted. And we kind of just want to walk through these. Some of these questions will apply to you. Some of them might not apply to you, but others will. And so we just kind of want to get a broad spectrum of, of godly people. And I want you to know, these are not only great parents. These are elders in our congregation. And so these are spiritual leaders in our congregation. And we appreciate them. And so I put the questions up on the screen. I'm going to ask them randomly, and then I'm just going to ask whoever feels led to respond, all right? So the only thing I would say is don't make me answer all the questions, okay? All right, so if we can put our first question is this. How should we handle conflict with kids? Actually, there's a second part of that. Should we allow them to see us fight? And should we acknowledge when we fight to them? And my first question, response was, fight? Vicki and I never fight, right? <laughs> huh? 
Obviously, that's, that's not true. Does anybody want to jump in and, and, uh, and handle that? And ladies, you respond as well. This isn't just a guy thing, all right? Kim? Um, I would say that your kids have already seen you fight. Um, whether or not you realize it or not, they're always paying attention. They always see what's going on, even if it's not an outright argument, screaming, yelling. Um, they, at least our kids, I don't, I'm assuming everybody's kids are like our kids, that uh, they're quick to, they, they're quick to notice when something's mm -hmm. off. Um, I would say, I don't think there's anything wrong with seeing your children see you have a conflict. I would say that it's uh, important that you learn to fight fair. Um, if we shouldn't be taking uh, digs, being negative towards our spouse, we shouldn't be malicious in the way that we respond. We should always be having conflict, but always being respectful about it so that our children see the right way to have conflict and uh, disagreements. Um, usually what hap what's happened in the past, I mean, ours are older now, so it's, it's a little different, but when in the past, when there has been a conflict between us and they've been witness to it, when, and they've been a witness to it. Um, Certainly the conflicts <laughs> don't start with Eric, right? He's, he's perfect, it's always, me. it's always me. <laughs> um, so when we have had conflict and they've seen it, um, we typically try to always uh, come back and address whatever it was that they saw. Mm. If I was uh, out of, the way if I spoke inappropriately in, in my tone or the way I disrespected him in front of them, uh, I would always address that I was wrong and I should have you know, handled it better. If I was emotional, that it's okay to feel what I'm feeling, you know, be emotional, but to have to think about what I'm gonna say. And uh, I guess what I'm saying is to address whatever it was that we did wrong in the situation. Um, depending on the conflict, they don't necessarily need to know what the resolution was. I think it's so just mostly addressing the behavior of what was happening in the interaction. If there was something that needed to be addressed, that they needed to see it, uh, what the resolution was and why it came that way, we would address that. But our thing is always fighting fair, is, I guess what I would say. Cool. Jim, were you gonna say something or? Uh, well, we never fought, so I don't know what to say here. <laughs> <laughs> For some no. reason, I think today at the end of the service is gonna be your first. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. yeah, probably. <laughs> um, yeah, we've, we've had arguments and everything, and it usually, a lot of times, it involves kids and, and they're, or they're around. Uh, but generally, we, we, we try to back off in, uh, of each other and, and to we're alone and we can talk. And what that always done for us, two things it's done for us, and it helped us, I think, is that uh, we, uh, uh, number one, it saves the, the, the chaos that the kid is seeing. And... Uh, and, and that kind of stress because kids are much more intuitive than we think and they know they understand they don't understand what's what it's about but they are upset because of it mm. and the other th thing that uh, was a positive about it was that we uh, uh, give especially me time to cool down so I could talk and think logically uh, uh, and we can come to a conclusion yeah. cool I would say this, um, I think it's great for our kids to see us humble ourselves and admit when we blow it. So, so if you always portray the fact that you're right, and you never make a mistake, and you never apologize, guess what your kids are going to do? They're, they're gonna respond in the same way. And so um, I think it's, it's excellent to be able to sit down, and I did with my guys on a regular basis, and say, hey, you know what? Dad responded wrong in that situation. I was wrong. I've already apologized to your mom, and I want to apologize to you. That, that wasn't acting in a way that honors and glorifies God, and so please forgive me. I think it's great. I think like Kim said, you know, we can't hide it. We can do the best we can, but we can't hide it. Our kids are really astute. And as they get older, the more astute they are, right? And so, but, but I think it's important. And I would also encourage you, read the latter part of Ephesians chapter four. Because in Ephesians chapter four, as Kim mentioned, it gives kind of rules for treating each other. 
Whenever we do marital counseling, we, we actually give uh, ground rules for fighting and arguing to our couples. And those are great verses. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another. Don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. Don't use an unkind word. Only say that which edifies, which glorifies God. Those are great guidelines. And, and moms and dads, if you don't have, you know, whether written or unwritten or, or understood rules for for, for discussion, it would be great for you to sit down as a couple and talk through that because your kids our, are watching and they are going to follow your example, good or bad. Good stuff. Anybody else? All right, next question. If we can have the next question. As a grandparent, how would you teach your grandchildren when the parents of the child don't believe in Christ? Wow, that's a tough one. So, I don't think Eric and Kim are grandparents yet, all right? So, uh, Beth? I think as a grandparent, we just need to take every opportunity that we're afforded with the child. Um, we don't get to spend as much time with our grandchildren that we would like to, but when we do, we do our best to make it profitable time. Um, in this day and age now, I've, even the six-year-olds have phones, so you can, we've, I've taken to texting little, um, uplifting stuff to my grandkids now and then, just let them know I'm thinking about them, praying for them. Um, just, just be there and let them know that you're willing to keep the lines of communication open for them and just enjoy them. Certainly, it's, it's easy when your kids, their parents are followers of Christ. It's more difficult when they're not followers of Christ. And so I, I, I don't think I would belligerently, you know, go against the parents' wishes because you don't want them to cut the child off from you. But I think you look for teaching moments, you know. So, so rather than sitting down and having a Bible study with the kids, to look for teaching moments so something happens in life and you're able to, to either just sit down and have a conversation with that child and bring out spiritual truth. And so little by little, maybe in a, in a, in a non-direct way, you're sharing the gospel with those kids over and over and over again. So let me ask you, how many grandparents do we have in the room today? If you're a grandparent, would you lift your hand? All right, we have grandparents all over the auditorium. So, so grandmas, let me encourage you, be Lois. All right, I'm not talking about Lois Lane in the Superman movies, all right? <laughs> talking about Lois, Timothy's grandmother. And, and grandpas, be spiritual grandpas. Be spiritual grandpas. Love them and look for every opportunity to point them to Jesus. Eric? Well, I kind of have a, a quick story to where uh, I know I'm in the position I'm in because of my great-grandmother, the prayers of her and, uh, and my grandmother as well. I used to go to my uh, great-grandmother's house to uh, help her do yard work. And uh, I would come in in the, uh, in the morning time, uh, coming through the, uh, the front door, and uh, my great-grandmother lived alone, and I always remember I would have to come and sit down in a chair and just be waiting on her because she would be having a conversation in her bedroom, and that conversation would be a prayer with Jesus. But you yeah. could hear her like she was having a regular conversation with, uh, like someone was there in the room with her. So me as a 12-year-old, I'm like, okay, this is going to take all day. I'm in here waiting for, for Grandma. But that was a mental note to me that every morning she started her morning with a conversation with Jesus. Hmm. She didn't have to say anything to me about God, but I saw it in her life. Amen. Uh, she lived it. So as, grand, as grandparents, you're able to live it in front of uh, your grandchildren as well. Cool, cool. All right, next question. What are some practical ways to teach my children how to live like Jesus when my spouse doesn't agree with my belief? It's a great question. So you're here and, and you want to point your kids to Jesus, but your husband is not a believer and doesn't support your faith, or your wife is not a believer and she doesn't support your faith. How do you do that? Anybody want to jump in on that? I think you live your life. Mm -hmm. You live your life as to the Lord. That's got to be something. That, that's got to account for something. Um, like Pastor said, you can't be the Holy Spirit but you can do and say and act in the way you know the Lord would want you to. Um, so you lead by example. Anybody else want to jump in? 
I would uh, totally agree with that because I'm a, a product of that. Um, Kim and I, we were not always walking with, uh, with God, and uh, God got a hold of Kim, my wife, uh, sooner than I did. Uh, so now we had this situation to where Kim was walking with God, and I was on the outside. And um, the biggest thing that Kim did for me was uh, she lived it. She didn't beat me over the head with the Bible. You need to be doing this. You need to be going to church. You, 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 you. She was like, listen, this is what God has spoken to me. Um, God is going to speak to you as well, but, but this is how I'm, I'm, I'm living, and, and this is where, where God has taken me. Uh, it's, it's so easy to start bashing the other person, trying to get them, uh, on, the other, uh, get them on, on board with you when that, that doesn't win uh, anybody over. Uh, and the Bible speaks about that uh, as well. Cool. You know, I would just take you to Ephesians again, where Paul challenges the husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church and the wives to respond to their husbands as the church responds to Jesus Christ. That's, a, that's the best example you can give to your kids. And then once again, I would look for opportunities to share Jesus with them, all right? I mean, unless your, your husband just absolutely prohibits you from doing that, I would look for those apropos moments, those divine appointments, as it were, where God gives you just a one-on-one -on -one with your child and you're able to, uh, to share the truth of the gospel with them. Can I just Jim? say, um, for everything that we're suggesting that you do, um, I pushed Eric with prayer. I, I wasn't pushing him with my words, I was pushing him with prayer. Um, I would say that with everything. I think that the way that we see those opportunities is if we're praying and we're seeking the Lord for those opportunities. I don't think we're just gonna magically, it's just gonna happen. Absolutely. Um, I think that every situation, um, we just, the Lord knows the situation better than we do. And he knows what, um, what the right word is for you to speak to that child that's gonna be able to plant the seed. So with everything, I would say pray, pray first, pray hard, pray first. That's the way we're gonna be able to live out lead by example, because it's so easy to get caught up in our flesh and so easy to get caught up in our frustration with our spouse because, you know, I, you know and who's not a believer, who's not believing the same thing that we do, um, we can get so caught up in those emotions of it. So if we're not prayerfully submitting ourselves to the Lord and saying, okay, Lord, you know what the day has for me today. I don't know what it has for me today. Give me the words and the peace and presence of mind to be able to speak what it is that you want me to speak mm -hmm. in the situation. Amen. So, um, that's what I would say cool. to that. Let's move on to the next question. When is the appropriate age to end spanking? Defer to you, yeah. <laughs> well, my dad spanked me yesterday, so I, so I, don't, I don't know what the answer is to that. <laughs> I, I would say uh, whenever he or she can take you down and hold you down, you better stop. <laughs> Whenever they become bigger than you, that's it's a good time, brother. That you need Eric to says stop that's right never. There. That's never going to happen. So I don't know. It's never going to happen, Eric. Says. Um, I would say this. I, I don't think there's a definitive time. You know, eight years old, nine years old, ten years old. I think you, as a parent, know when it works and when it doesn't work. Uh, I think you get to the place that you realize that's not the most effective way to discipline my child. I remember mom and dad's here, and I'm sure mom's heard me tell this story before. So, you know, dad would be at work, and I would do something that, you know, the, that was wrong, and, and mom would paddle me, and I'm like, yeah, go ahead and do it before dad comes home. Go ahead, you know, because, because at that age, she didn't hit me hard enough that it hurt near as bad as dad, that dad's paddling, so I'm like, yeah, I'm all, I'm in. I'm bending over. I'm ready to go on all of that, you know? And so, and then, and then Bruce and I'd walk in the other room and I'd say, that hurt you? Nah, that didn't hurt me either, you know? And so at that point, it gets to not be effective. And so I think you've got to use discretion. And, and even with some kids, some forms of discipline are more effective than other forms of discipline. And I think the idea is to be able to discipline the child so they understand the difference right from wrong, what they did wrong at that moment, and, uh, and it's corrective. The idea, please understand, the idea is, the whole idea of discipline is it's corrective. It's not you demonstrating anger. It's not you, you know, bursting out in anger. It's you being able to wrap
rationally, calmly be able to discipline your child so they know the difference between right and wrong. Jim, you going to say something? I just want to say, I, uh, I remember one time when my son, uh, I forget how old he was, but uh, uh, I started giving him a choice. I said, okay, you, you got your choice. You want to spank or, or you want, uh, uh, not time out, but uh, grounding for two weeks yeah. or whatever. Right. And his choice was, give me the spanking. <laughs> That's when I, remember, I realized I need to change the other way. <laughs> That's cool. No, uh, to, to piggyback on everyone here, you have to understand your child's love language. Spanking might not be effective, but take the phone away or the PlayStation or the car keys. Now, 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 you, got their, now you got their attention. So you have to figure out what is their love language or, or what, what is their language? Come on, me, you're disciplining. And I would say this too, don't ever discipline in anger and don't ever discipline without sitting down afterward and applying spiritual truth and praying with your child. Because what you want to see, you want to see God do a work in that child. And if all they think is, oh, I angered mom and so she paddled me or I made dad mad so he punished me and they don't see the spiritual truth behind it, you're not accomplishing what you want to accomplish in that child's life. So it's so very important. Don't just, and, and if you're angry, wait. All right, if you're responding out of anger, wait. Get your emotions under control. Number one, you don't wanna hurt the child to a degree that, you know, child services are gonna be called in on you or something like that, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, babe. Yeah, that's a good. Oh, I'm just going to say that, you know, you need to have, have a unified. Ooh, there we go. You know, you and dad, mom and dad need to be on the same place with that. You know, otherwise, <laughs> mom's saying one thing, dad's saying another, and that's not good. That just confuses them. They're and by the way, learn. kids have a, a modus operandi that's called divide and conquer. All right. And so if they can divide you and get one on their side, they have conquered and they have won. And so it's so very important for mom and dads to always be on the same page. That's great. Let's go to the next one. How do I combat the teaching of evolution and same-sex marriage my child is learning in the public school system? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I personally think we teach that the same way we teach every other biblical truth. Mm -hmm. um, we keep lines of communication open. We use the opportunities to share the truth with them. Um, I would caution us all to not be judgmental in how we speak with our children with regard to this, these situations. Um, I know from personal experience that um, it can drive a big wedge in families. So everything that we do, we're supposed to do with love and grace and to be uplifting, um, not condemning and not judging. Just, and again, the Holy Spirit will solidify that truth in your children's heart and mind. Excellent, excellent. Realize God's word over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Teach them when you get up in the morning. Teach them when you go to bed at night, as you're walking, as you're driving in the car, as they're coming home from school. Teach them God's word. And you trust God's word to do the job. All right, next question. I think we have a few more. What is the recommended way to biblically handle a strong-willed child? Can we put the spanking one back up? <laughs> <laughs> um, prayer, uh, first and foremost, uh, prayer. A lot of times um, God will kind of show you yourself through your child. Okay, God, what are you trying to, uh, to teach me? as I'm uh, trying to discipline this child or trying to get, uh, uh, trying to get through uh, uh, to this child. Uh, like Pastor was saying, uh, nothing works in anger. Nothing is gonna work in, uh, in anger. Sometimes you have to remove yourself from the situation, 
okay, God, what is it? Uh, n not my feelings, not my flesh, because I want to strangle this child right now, and I know that's, that's not going to work. Again, uh, but what do I need to do to, uh, uh, to, to get through to this child? And also, don't be afraid of, uh, of counseling. Don't be afraid of bringing in a third party that's going to help you maybe see a different side of, uh, uh, that, that you didn't see uh, before. Excellent. Somebody else? Yeah. I just had one thing. I have a strong will child. <laughs> um, God gave me a gentle answer. Every time we would get into the strong will battle, God would always just sound off in my head a gentle answer, a gentle answer. And the other was, do not provoke your children. strong willed children can be easily provoked. So with those two um, biblical truths bouncing around in my head, <laughs> when I had to deal with her, it was always a gentle answer and don't provoke. Mm. Good, excellent. Yeah. I've always kind of felt like a strong will is, you know, sometimes we look at that as very negative, but it's not. It's a positive thing. And if their energies in that strong will can be focused and sharpened in the right way, just imagine how God can use that strong will for his glory. Amen. And so that, you know, that's one way to pray about that. Consistency is huge with a strong willed child. Be involved and be there and be, you know, be sharp yourself. Know what's going on. You know, and then address and talk. Keep that communication open. Address that, those situations. Don't be afraid to. You know, God will give you strength and the courage in those moments, and the Holy Spirit will lead your words. So, um, you know, but love them. Do it all in love, you know, speaking the truth with them. But be firm, you know and try to channel that strong will in the right direction. It would be awesome for yeah. God. Uh, one more, let's go to the last question. Um, if we go to the last question, Liza, the last question, what are practical things to pray for for my child? Number one, pray that they love God with all their heart, soul, and mind. That's it. Amen. When they love God with all their heart, soul, and mind, they're gonna make good decisions. They're gonna make good choices. They're going to live out the gospel. Pray that they love the Lord with all their heart, soul, and mind. Never stop praying that for them. I pray that for my boys, all of our family, and um, that's number one. There's other things, I'm sure. Yeah. I don't need to talk anymore. <laughs> All right, uh, I'm gonna end. Let's give them a hand. Can we do that? Not, not easy, not easy for them. I had to twist all of their arms in order to get them up here today. I wanna end with one verse and I'm gonna ask our praise team to come out and if our elders and deacons would, would begin to gravitate towards the back to prepare for the Lord's Supper. Can I read you one verse? If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Joshua 24, 15. I'm not going to preach another message. I want you to hear this verse. I want this verse to be your commitment as a family. This is Joshua at the end of the book of Joshua who makes this challenge to the people of Israel. He says this, if it's evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river, the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell. And Joshua makes this commitment. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Would you make that commitment today? Would you make that commitment? doesn't mean you're not going to make mistakes. It doesn't mean that your kids might not struggle for a while. It might not mean anything, but you as the spiritual leaders of your home, future spiritual leaders of your home, make the commitment, God, with your help and with your empowerment, as for us and our house, we will serve the Lord. You know, the best way for us to reach our country with the gospel, the best way for us to reach our city with the gospel, is for us to reach our families with the gospel. All right, we're losing the next generation. It starts at home, doesn't start at church. 
starts at home. Let's be the moms and dads and papas and grandmas and aunts and uncles that God desires for us to be. And let's point our family to Jesus. Would you stand with me? Our elders and deacons are going to take their places. When you're ready, I would encourage you to do a bit of self-examination. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 to not partake of these elements without examining ourselves. So you do a little bit of self-examination. If there's sin in your life, I encourage you to confess it. The altar is open. Whenever you're ready, come and grab a piece of bread and a little cup from our elders. Take it back to your place. We're going to take it together in just a few moments. But let's worship God together. And by the way, I would say this. We've talked about family goals. Catch this. We're all a part of a family. Look around. This is your family. HCC is your family. We're doing life together. All right? We need each other. And the head of our family is Jesus. And today... We worship Him, and we praise Him, and we recognize Him. So you take these elements today. You remember with a heart of gratitude what Jesus has done for you and what He is doing for you. And let's trust Him to keep working in our lives and in the lives of our kids. You come when you're ready, grab the elements, take them back. We'll take them together in just a few moments. Jonas. Jonas.